turn in your Bibles this evening to the book of Joel. What I intend to do is to read through this book this evening with you and to comment um, on each chapter. So we will be beginning at the beginning, chapter 1. Give you some of the background context. Joel is writing most likely around 820 BC or thereabouts, so 820 years before the coming of Christ. I'll give you more historical information in a moment, but he is one of the earlier of the writing prophets. There were prophets who spoke and didn't write anything. Um, Nathan would be an example of one, Elijah and other. Um, and then we have writing prophets that record for us uh, words that have been inscripturated. So Joel is one of the earliest of those. Beginning then with verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, ye old men and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it. And let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, the locust hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek, the teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my fine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree. The palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And as the destruction from the Almighty shall it come, is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down. For the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. <coughs> Amen. May God bless to us his word. The name Joel means Jehovah is God. Jehovah is God. The Lord demonstrates that both in history and in the ministry of this prophet. He is, as I said, one of the earliest writing prophets, ministering around 820 years before the coming of Christ. 
in and around the reign of King Joash in 2 Kings chapter 11 would give some of the background. So you have Jehoram as king, and then after that, Azariah is killed by Jehu. Athaliah comes uh, into uh, the position of prominence. There, he, she's uh, Jehoram's wife, and she kills all of the grandchildren so that she might claim the throne. All that is, apart from one, whose name is Joash, he's saved by the priest Jehoiada, and at the age of seven, he is brought to the throne. After he's crowned, Athaliah is executed. And under the guidance of the priest Jehoiada, uh, Joash ministers in obedience to the Lord. He, he deals with much of the idolatry that plagues the people of God. But in 820 BC, Jehoiada dies. And Joash then becomes influenced by all of the Baal sympathizers in the land of Judah. Joel is ministering at that time. God sends him to the southern kingdom to call that people to repent. And we discover that particularly in chapter 1 and 2 of the book. And not only do we find that, but likewise... We have much encouragement given. God calls to repentance, and then he tells us what his response will be to that repentance. The second half of chapter 2 into chapter 3. But we're looking for now at chapter 1. And in chapter 1, there's a past plague uh, that is recounted for us. A plague of locusts. Joel is saying to the people of his day, think about this plague. That has attacked the land. <coughs> Verse 6, he describes it uh, as an army in a sense. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. But it's not a literal army. It's a larmy, an army of insects. And so you find that in verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. There are various views as to what each of these particular Animals or insects are the palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar. Some see them as different species of locusts. Others see them as different life stages of a locust, like the larvae stage, and then maybe whatever the other stages are. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. Because what the Lord is saying here is that these insects destroyed everything. They destroyed everything. What one left, the other destroyed. What it left, the other destroyed. So on and so forth. So that when we come to verse 7, he hath laid uh, my vine waste and barked my fig tree. The, the bark has been, been stripped from the trees. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Everything has been destroyed. Then from verse 8 through to the end of the chapter, everyone has been affected. Everything has been destroyed and everyone has been affected. Verse 5 through 7, the drunkards have no wine to drink. Verse 8 through 10, the people have no bread to eat. Verse 11 through 12, the farmers have no crops in their field. Later, the animals have no food. And in verse 9 and verse 13, the priests have no offerings for the house of God. Verse 9, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. Verse 13, gird yourselves and lament ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. 
There's no drink, there's no bread, there's no crops, there's no food for the animals, there's no offerings for the beasts, there's no joy, and there's no gladness among the people of God. Well, says Joel, I want you to search your past. I want you to search your past and consider whether or not you've ever seen anything like this before. That's what he's saying to the generation he's speaking to. Verse 2. Hear this, ye old men, and give ye all ye inhabitants of the land. Have this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? This is unique. Oh, you've seen hard times, but nothing like this before. God is clearly speaking to you through this act of providence. So search your past, there's nothing like it. When you come to that conclusion, tell the future. Verse 3, tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children, another generation. Tell them what the Lord has done. Consider the past. Tell your children in the, in the future. And verse 14, in the present, call a fast. In the present, call a fast. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God. And cry unto the Lord. God is sovereign over nature and over nations. God is sovereign over nature and over nations. He's sovereign over insects. And he can bring a plague of insects as a temporal judgment upon people. One of the horrors of this chapter is that a plague has hit the people of Judah like the plague that God used to judge the nation of Israel or of Egypt. It's like God is treating his covenant people the way he treated their enemies. On the surface, God is judging them and chastening them for their sins. He's not doing it only in the same way that it's in Egypt, but he's doing it as he said he would do in the book of Deuteronomy. I'm making my covenant with you. If you are unfaithful uh, with me in the covenant, then plague after plague and judgment after judgment is going to rain down upon you. I will send war and famine and pestilence and in the end, exile. God is doing what he said. God is still sovereign over nations. God is still sovereign over nature. And God judges nations in time. And he chastens his church in time. Our nation needs to hear this. God is sovereign over nature. Even the things that we can't see in nature. Like viruses. If you look out at our land and we're in the midst of a viral infection, in the midst of that there's political turmoil and upheaval. There have been riots in the street, cities have burned, the capital of your country has been stormed. And Democrats fight with Republicans and Republicans fight with Democrats. And God says, sanctify ye fast. Sanctify ye fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord, your God, and cry unto the Lord. This nation needs to recognize the sovereignty of God in judgment over it and turn unto God in repentance. Amen. And so does the church. Because of this judgment in nature, churches have clothes. 
Like here, verse 9 and in verse 13, no offerings have been made in the house of the Lord. What are we to do in response to that? Verse 8, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the, hus the husband of her youth. Lament broken hearted before the Lord. Verse 13, gird yourselves and lament ye priests. How will ye ministers of the altar come? Lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. Verse 16, is not the meat cut off before our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. We've spoken about these things many times. When the crisis hit us in March, do you remember the sermon that I preached in Hosea? That we were to rend our hearts because it was time to seek the Lord. Did we do it? Have we done it? We listened to the sermons that Pastor McCurdy preached when we weren't able to have our own midweek meeting and there was a common theme there. He kept taking us to see God's hand in judgment and his call to repentance. Well, we've complained about the governor. We've complained about, doc about Dr. Fauci. We've sh shaken our fists about lockdowns. We've argued about masks. But we haven't humbled ourselves and sought the Lord. Have we? We haven't. And yet we wag the finger and we even say, this nation needs to repent and yet we don't repent. It's not just our political leaders that don't have ears to hear. It's not just the church, broadly speaking, that doesn't have ears to hear. Do we have ears to hear? God says to this generation, do you see what I've done? Have you seen the light of it before? Have you, have you seen the light of 2020 in your lifetime before? What are we to do? Lament, cry. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly and humble our hearts before God. Joel chapter one, we have a past plague. And it called the church and nation to repentance. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. But we're going to sing in Psalm 107. Psalm 107. We'll sing from verse 32 of the psalm. But we see how the Lord turns what is fruitful into barrenness for the sins of the people, just like he did in the days of Joel. But the hope is he can turn what is barren and make it fruitful again when we turn and seek the Lord. Psalm 107, verse 32 through 38, the tune Torwood. No.
and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his strength shall come up, and his ill savour shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow flow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens, and in the earth blood, and fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to us. In chapter 1, there was a past plague of locusts. In chapter 2, God now threatens his people with a future plague. The chapter begins with a call to blow the trumpet. On the horizon, an army is attacking. And the watchman upon the walls is to put the trumpet to his lips and sound an alarm because the day of the Lord has come. Now you read first of this day of the Lord in verse 15 of chapter 1. Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand as a, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Chapter 2 verse 1, we're seeing it coming. The day of the Lord is mentioned five times throughout this book and it's very interesting. Indeed, it teaches you certain uh, principles about the interpretation of prophecy. Very often there will be an immediate application to the hearers. Then after that there will be an application to the coming of Christ the first time. And then after that there will be an application to the coming of Christ the second time. And all that is here in the book of Job. An historical judgment before Christ comes, an application to the coming of Christ in the New Testament period, an application to the second coming of Christ at the end. Well, this trumpet is to be blown. And Joel uses previous history from chapter 1 to illustrate future judgment. Just like he said in chapter 1, tell me, have you ever seen a plague of locusts like this one? And the answer is, no, they haven't. When you come into chapter 2, he says, there's another invasion going to take place. The light of which you have never seen before. But it's not a plague of locusts, no. It's a foreign army. You know, if you read it slowly and take in the imagery, it's... Spine tingling. This army is arranged in columns and no one breaks rank. Nothing can stop the advance of it. They steal walls. Anything in its path is destroyed. They climb in windows like a thief in the night. 
to kill everyone who rests at ease in their bed. In chapter 1 through 11, God is saying, blow the trumpet. Because my army of judgment is coming to destroy Judah for their sins. And just like in chapter 1, the locusts destroyed everything and everyone was affected. Look at chapter 2 verse 3. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Do you see this army, children? It marches through fruitful fields. And having passed through them, everything is, is burned. Everything is scorched and burnt. And death. The message from the Lord is simple. You did not learn from the locusts. You did not learn from the locusts. And now I am going to amplify my judgment against you. Seven times seven. But then in God's mercy... There's another trumpet blow. In verse 1, it's a trumpet of alarm. In verse 15, it's a call to repent. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Judah must repent. Otherwise, it's going to be obliterated. Indeed, in the verses before verse 15, we're given the kind of repentance that they are to bring to God. Verse 12, Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. What an encouragement. God's army is what is described in verse 1 through 11. He says, it's my army, and they're not going to leave anything in their way. But then he says, I'm merciful, I'm gracious, turn to me with all of your heart. And it will repent me of the evil. In other words, <laughs> judgment will be averted. Don't come with your sham penitence. Don't come merely outwardly rending your clothes, wearing sackcloth, putting ashes upon your head. I'm not interested in that, says the Lord. Bring to me your broken hearts. Bring to me your sincere repentance. His people were to come to God with all their hearts. But then we also note that this people were to come with all their members. Look at verse 16. Who's to come to this fast, this assembly, this day of repentance? Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. Gather the children. And those that suck the breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Elders, adults, children, sucking children, people who are on their honeymoon, all of you have to come. And rend your hearts and not your garments before the Lord. You see the transition, verse 1 through 11, the thread of this army of judgment. Then verse 12 through verse 17, the call to repentance. You can stay this judgment, God is merciful. And then verse 18, in a sense, the hinge of the whole book. 
God comes to them with a promise and says, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and will say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. The call to repentance is not backed up with a message of restoration. God will pour out blessings upon his penitent people. One of the ways that the Old Testament prophets speak of this, going back to, to the book of Deuteronomy, if you sin against me, barrenness, pestilence, war, famine, exile, but if you return unto me, fruitfulness, peace, prosperity, and the prophet Joel takes up those judgments and blessings from the book of Deuteronomy and he begins to apply them to the people of God. You repent, you'll find me merciful. I'll transform your barrenness into fruitfulness. I'll take away this invading army and I'll give you peace in the land once again. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. That this people so wretched in their sin by the God of all grace are going to be restored through repentance. That sinners who corrupted themselves are going to be cleansed. That men and women who are guilty are going to be forgiven. That people who are broken are going to be healed. There's all these pictures of reversals, gracious reversals. How the Lord turns around it's their judgment to bring blessing. Well, that's a wonderful word to Judah, isn't it? But you see, I said not only does it have a reference to the original hearer, but you also find this threefold application to the prophets. And don't we see it here at the end of chapter 2? Because he takes us beyond any judgment merely of Judah to predict a day when the Lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Does that sound familiar to you children? That was the text of the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. Indeed, some people have referred to Joel as the prophet of Pentecost. Now bring that into what we've said. Judgment's coming, but turn from me and live. I'll forgive all of your sins, and I'll grant you blessing and fruitfulness. The temporal judgments are predicting something. The agricultural blessings are predicting something. What is it? The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ who calls sinners to repentance and those who come unto him receive all the blessing and fruitfulness of the Spirit of God. Fruitfulness, healing, joy. And also repenting and believing the gospel. Well, you see in chapter 1 there's a past plague of locusts. In chapter 2, there's a future plague, and it has reference to those who heard it in that day, and a spiritual reference to us who hear it in our day. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. We stand for prayer. Uh, Charlie Leverett, please, if you could be us in prayer. Almighty God. Help us to hear your word and to obey it in our great, great warnings, terrible judgments. And there are many blessings. And I pray, Father, we understand that, that every sin has a terrible cost. We see it in the ceremonies. We see it in the life of Christ. That sin is death. Either one dies by his own hand in life, or Christ becomes the substitute.
to die for us, and his blood was shed a precious, the most precious life ever, a perfect life, has to die and did die for every sin that we have committed. The price is high. And we love to live in our death. We're used to it. Help us to turn from death in all of its judgments. Turn to life in Christ. An abundant life. A life that is peace with God. A life that is a life of righteousness that comes by the Spirit and Word. A life that is pleasing to you. A life that is a light unto the world as Christ was a light. Father, we, we struggle. It's so difficult. It's so difficult. And we have our, our own idols. We have ourselves, our ego. We're egocentric and self-serving. And it's a terrible, it's a terrible trap. So we pray again for our repentance as we have read, heard read and preached. And Joel, help us to turn, to turn away and to hate. You know how we love our sin. We're habitually used to it. Help us to turn away and hate it. And turn to and love it as we look upon Christ. Oh, how blessed we are to look upon Christ and find the strength to turn live under Christ's likeness. Father, there's great judgment before us and the church will suffer. And hell is stirred. Gehenna is alive, waiting for all those who are held down. And hell will be full of pretend Christians who engage in and some kind of false religious religiosity. We cannot be pretenders. We have been warned. The pretenders who try to worship by their own ways, their own means, their own way of meaning, meaningful things, that's the way of death. It's a pretend religion. Israel was full of it. Never condemned. Let us know the ways of the Lord through the Word, which brings life. It is life. If it is dry doctrine, then we are not alive unto it. I pray your Spirit come and make us alive to it. It is the Word of life. So Father, the, it is wonderful to be with you and call you our God. You are our, our Father, our Heavenly Father. You are our you are the good shepherd through Christ. You are our creator. You are our redeemer. We are slaves who have been freed from captivity. Let us act like free men who have given ourselves to Christ, who have stood at the door and had our ear punched with an awl to serve a righteous master forever. Father, it may there not be a famine of the preaching of the word or of the hearing of it. The pastors that the church has are mostly dry stubble today, and many, many are lost. But not here. But we need to respond. We need to give. We need to put off and put on. We need to praise with our lips and praise with our hearts and praise with our lives. Help us, please. I hope you hear our cry for help. We're crying for your help. It's just too easy here. It's too easy. Our brothers in many places like China and North Korea and Niger and Nigeria are persecuted by communists and Boko Haram. They're killed outright. Women taken into slavery and abused sexually. It's too easy here. The cost of discipleship is low. Help us, please, Father. We pray, Father, for our particular needs. And we do need a place. We thank you for this one. May we not grow slack. May we remember that Israel had a building 
They had an entire city and a nation, and they lost it all. Every bit of it. So when you provide for us, we're going to step up. It says Israel had to capture the land, the land flowing with milk and honey. We will have to capture everything you provide for us. We will have to move ahead. We will have to sacrifice. So help us, please, Father. We thank you for our office bearers. We pray for your blessing upon them, for Bill and Gavin. And they need special help and comfort, encouragement always, because their jobs are just about impossible. It's only by the Spirit that you lift them up. As you lifted up Joshua in the battle, lift them up. May we uphold them. We pray, Father, for conversions. We heard Nana's request, uh, his friends and others he's witnessing to. And I know many others are sharing the gospel. I lift up this woman, Yanni, that I met this morning. We pray for these people that come to Christ, yet we cannot elect. It's the Father who elects. Father who elects, we ask for your blessing of your spirit and word and gospel unto the souls of many who do not know you. Rescue the perishing. Yes. Father, we pray uh, for those works in uh, Philadelphia and Auburn. Bless them, there will be much opposition. And that's the perfect place to start a church. That needs to be opposition. Or it will stand. It will stand strong. We pray for the exploratory work in Sioux Falls. Father, these, these places, it's a great time to start a church when everything is going downhill. Mm -hmm. Just as Jerusalem was rebuilt when the enemies were attacking, with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. We pray, Father, for the building of the walls and the extension of the kingdom. Everywhere. Every place is yours. We don't want to give it to the heathen. We don't want to give it to the secularists and the atheists. Father, it's not theirs. Help us to extend the church, the kingdom of God, hmm. that you would be glorified and not your name not trounced by men and disrespected, but lifted up and receiving the praise you deserve. Things to your glory, for the glory of Christ, for the glory of the Father, the glory of the Spirit. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's read in Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. <coughs> they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine. They might drink. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because ye have taken my silver and my gold, and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the land of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabaeans, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. 
and gather yourselves together round about thither, cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is real. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valleys of Shepim. Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land, but Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Amen. I said to you already that Joel speaks of the day of the Lord on five occasions throughout this book. And the language is eschatological, not simply as a theological term that refers to last things. Eschatology really just refers to the study of last things. But remember how I said the prophets speak. They look at something that's near, and then they look at something that's further away. And the prophets themselves may not have understood how all these things would uh, be fulfilled throughout history. And so you get it again here. There's something that's going to happen that's near. There's exile. There's a return from exile. There's judgment upon the nations who afflicted Judah. But that's not all that the prophet is speaking about here. Because you know in the New Testament that these uh, images are taken up and applied to the church. The church is Jerusalem, Israel, and Judea. The enemies of the church are like the enemies of Judah. And in the end, the Lord is going to come and save his people and destroy every one of his enemies and their enemies. In this chapter, God leads his army taking vengeance upon that, those enemies. You see the army advancing, it's, it's a different army than in chapter 2 that God was using to judge Judah. This is the Lord's army who he is now using to judge the enemies of Judah. Her brother was praying about Christians in Niger and North Korea, Nigeria. Christian women being enslaved and sexually abused. People being killed because of their faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage speaks directly to that kind of thing. And it tells us that God is going to obliterate the enemies of his church who do such things. You see in verse 2 and 3, I will also gather all nations, and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people, and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for an harlot, and so the slave for wine, and they might drink. 
That's what we were praying about a moment ago. And God says, I'm going to bring him down. And I will plead for my people there. And on that day, woe be unto them. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, verse 14, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Put ye in the sickle where the harvest is ripe. It's a day of the Lord. Chapter 1, it was a day of the Lord. There was a plague of locusts. <coughs> chapter 1 into chapter 2, there was a day of the Lord. And it was an army marching against Judah. But the day of the Lord, ultimately... Well, the day of the Lord is the day of Pentecost in the New Testament blessing. Chapter 2. The day of the Lord, ultimately, is this great day when Jesus Christ will come the second time, not, not unto salvation, but unto the judgment of all those who oppose him. And we have the language of cosmic upheavals here. We saw some of it in chapter 2 about the moon turning into blood and so on. But look at verse 15 of chapter 3. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Now catch the imagery. Put in the sickle. For the harvest is ripe. God speaks about that in the book of Revelation, doesn't he? Turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. Luke 21, we've just read, The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withhold their shining on that great day of the Lord. Luke chapter 21. In verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. What's he doing? Joel chapter 3. The Lord is going to plead with his enemies. The Lord is going to plead with his enemies. Not in mercy, but in judgment. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 and you'll find the same thing. I'll say when you're returning to this portion, the Lord uses the destruction of Jerusalem in the same way in Mark 13 and Matthew chapter 24. Same way he's doing with the prophets. It refers to something immediate, but it goes beyond that. It takes us to the last day. Revelation chapter 6. We find ourselves on that day. Verse 12 and following. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and every an island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? What's happening? 
The Lord Jehovah has arisen to plead with his enemies. But he arises in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the kings of the earth and the great men and all the enemies of the church of Christ are gathered there. And the Lord is revealed in flaming fire, taking vengeance against those that know not God. And do you know what the scariest thing on that day is, children? Do you know what the scariest thing on that day is? Listen carefully. Jesus. Jesus is the scariest thing on that day. People are asking mountains to fall upon them to hide them from Jesus. Do you know what the scariest thing in hell is, children? The wrath of Jesus. God has arisen to plead his cause against his enemies. And Jesus will destroy every last one of them. At the end of Joel chapter 3, having presented the destruction of the wicked, we have a picture of the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem was plagued by locusts and then threatened by that army in chapter 2. And the Lord is restoring the fortunes of this city. Verse 17, so shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Verse 21, For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. You see these two great eschatological events? The destruction of the wicked in hell. And the reception of the church. The bride of Christ. The holy city. New Jerusalem. And as Revelation chapter 21 and 22 tell us, the Lord will dwell in the midst of his people. The pattern is there at the end of that book. Revelation chapter 21, the camp of the saints are, is surrounded by, by the enemies of God. Gog and Magog, whatever they are, what happens? Their backs are against the wall and the Lord is revealed from heaven and he destroys every last one of them and he saves the camp of the saints. Chapter 21, chapter 22, there she is, perfected, glorified, beautified, those that the Lord has brought through great tribulation, they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They overcome all of their enemies by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives, even unto the death. And God receives them unto himself, and he dwells with them. In new heavens and new earth, but in dwelleth righteousness forever. 820 years before Jesus came the first time, the prophet Joel was used to teach us all these things. Judgment and salvation. Repentance and God's response, response to it. All pointing to a climax. And the message of the gospel at the heart of the book, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter preaches it on the day of Pentecost. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul preaches it to us in the book of Romans. Romans 10, verse 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But to all who will not repent and believe the gospel, God will plead against you and his vengeance forever. Three plagues, a past plague, a future plague, 
on the final day. May the Lord bless His word to our hearts.